Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, I think this will be the last, this will be the last of the Australian Institute of Physics Theoretical Physics Seminar Series for this calendar year. I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental Physics um, and uh, Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU. And I'm hosting this series of talks on behalf of the AIP Theoretical Physics Group. I'd like to start, as I always do, by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation, the traditional custodians or lands upon which uh, ANU was based. And of course, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of lands all around Australia. This year, we've had a very wide range of talks on varying, on varying subjects related to theoretical physics, and they are available to watch on the AIP YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be continuing this series of seminars uh, on theoretical physics next year. Um, so to make sure that you remain informed as to what's coming up, please feel free to join the theoretical physics group of the AIP. Um, that'll make it easier for us to keep you informed. Today's talk is being presented by Professor Daniel Bergarth, who hails from Macquarie University, my old alma mater, as I was just saying to Daniel, on the subject of the rotating wave approximation. As we know from our undergraduate training in quantum mechanics, um, this is an approximation that is used in various um, contexts, which I'm sure Daniel is going to talk about, but particularly in relation to the solutions to the problems of uh, Hamiltonians for the description of the interaction between matter and bosonic fields, such as the electromagnetic field. It's an old subject in some respects. As we know, we would have encountered it first in our undergraduate degrees, but it's been very much uh, renewed by the challenges of the development of quantum devices and quantum engineered systems in particular, and enables us to find solutions for Rabi models and their generalizations, the original semi-classical model of Rabi and later the Jane, Jane's Cummings model. And more recently it's found applications in the, uh, what people loosely refer to as the quantum, quantum Rabi model. So which there are several variants, the asymmetric quantum Rabi model that we work on here at ANU, the anisotropic quantum model, the there's something called the generalized quantum Rabi model, which enables um, uh, modeling, including two photon interactions, for, for example. And some of these variations have exact solutions, either via the Bogoli Bob transformations or via a transformation of the Bargman space of complex functions. Um, but the properties of these solutions are very, are very uh, complex. Um, and it's hard to know what all the implications are, particularly the eigenstates associated with the eigenvalues that one might be able to calculate via exact means. So this means that there is very much a need to continue with the analysis of this field in terms of appropriate approximations and the rotating wave approximation in particular. So this brings us to an interesting result, which Daniel is going to be describing today, which provides some information about the domain of applicability of the rotating wave approximation. Daniel's talk today is entitled Taming the Rotating Wave Approximation. Thanks, Daniel. Over to you. Thank you very much, David, for the kind introduction. And thank you to Murray and David for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. And actually, it's, a, it's an honor to see so many smart people in the audience. And with such a nice introduction, I'm already scared of the questions that you're going to ask me later. Uh, but for the moment, I will start giving my talk. I would like to acknowledge uh, most of all my, my collaborators who have contributed to this work. So part of what I'm going to present is joint work with Paolo Faki, Giovanni Gamegna, and Kazuya Yuasa, who's also in the audience. And this is published recently. And another part of the work is in a more recent generalization. Uh, which is submitted uh, with uh, Paolo Faki, Robin Hillia, and Marilena Ligabo. The outline of my talk is pretty straightforward. So I will give you an introduction to the rotating wave approximation. And I guess the key point I want to make there is that there are actually three quite different rotating wave approximations that should be considered. And I wanna give you a little bit of an incomplete history of that uh, rotating wave approximation. Then I focus on the first rotating wave approximation and how you would have encountered it in your undergraduate degree and which arguments we find in the literature for the validity of it. Then I want to tame it. So I, I kind of turn this uh, beast into something more, more tangible. Um, 
And then I talk about the rotating wave approximation number two. And I also want to tame it. And that beast is even more beastly than the, than the first one, but uh, we succeeded in taming it recently. And uh, I'll come to my conclusion. So the third rotating wave approximation, which is about open quantum systems, is something that is work in progress. So I won't report here. I wanna start a little bit more general by talking about approximations, or you might say how I'm finally beginning to understand my own undergraduate, because uh, frankly speaking, there was a lot I didn't understand. So I'm, I'm not a philosopher, so this is very, very naive, but what is an approximation? So in my mind, a, approximation is a, a modification to a model that should give similar results and hopefully be simpler because otherwise, what would be the point of doing the approximation? And as you all know, physics and also quantum physics is full of approximations. So the rotating wave approximation, which is today's subject, but the, the list really goes on and on. Um, and you might find some of your own research subjects here by looking through this list. This is by no means complete. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's mind boffling how many uh, approximations there are. The green ones are some that I know a little bit more about. Uh, the black ones I probably don't know anything about and the red one is the subject of today. So what, what justifies a, an approximation? I think this is a, a, a reasonable question. Um, and, and maybe the best answer is uh, the match with an experiment, right? Because we are physicists, we are not necessarily mathematicians. So ultimately the, the goal is to describe what we can also observe. I worry a little bit about bias there. Um, maybe some observations are not necessarily published. And I want to argue that an experiment could also confirm for the wrong reason. So what could happen is that you have the wrong theory and you apply the wrong approximation and you get a correct prediction. And although that sounds bonkers, I would uh, suggest that quantum field theory might be one of those subjects because very frankly speaking, the theory must be wrong. Frankly speaking, the approximations are wrong, but the predictions, the experimental predictions are fantastic, right? So uh, this is an interesting case. Now, another, Justification, of course, is a match with numerics. Of course, we know that when we do numerics, we usually can only look at a limited parameter range. So it's not always conclusive. And um, sometimes um, the, the numerics can also be unstable. I'll come back to that later in the talk. The main way I encounter justifications of approximations are somewhat hand wavy stories. So, I remember as an undergrad that my professor would often go into story mode and say, once upon a time, there was an electron who was far away from, and so on. Um, and, and it's interesting to note that sometimes the story can be wrong, even though the approximation is correct. So the example I wanna give here is Hunt's rule, where when I was an undergrad, what I learned was that um, electrons with the same spin tend to keep out each other's way, um, and therefore they minimize the Coulomb interaction. But um, nowadays you can do um, very accurate um, computer simulations of what goes on. And you find that in many molecules, um, even though they're less likely to be close, that's true, they're also less likely to be very far apart. And when you actually compute the Coulomb term, uh, the energy is actually slightly higher. So that doesn't really explain why Hans rule holds. Nevertheless, Hans rule often holds. And the reason apparently is because the electron nucleus attraction is substantially greater in those states. So this is the right rule, but the wrong hand wavy story. Another way you can justify um, approximations is by instinct or intuition. And an instinct and intuition is really the core of the creative thinking of a physicist, right? It's, it's absolutely amazing what people can do with just uh, back of the envelope calculation. It works amazingly well often. Until, of course, we encounter something that doesn't work and then we say that's counterintuitive. Which is also great because if it's counterintuitive, we can publish it in physical review letters. Another justification is that often approximations are the only way forward. So we simply cannot calculate anything else. We might also find that we have a mathematical limit justifying an approximation. So as a parameter goes to infinity or goes to zero, um, we might have um, equality. Of course, there the problem is uh, 
you know, how far actually are we with some specific parameters? How far are we from infinity? Or how, how much smaller is smaller, smaller than one? Is it is 0 0.1 really smaller, smaller than one? Or should it be 0 0.01? So I, I would argue that then an error bound really in, in this chain of, of justifications is the supreme justification. And of course, an error bound, at least in my definition of a approximation, should always exist, but it might be very hard to find in practice. And so I think a lot of us think, and I maybe used to think that myself, that finding such bounds is, is sort of technical and boring and maybe should be left to mathematicians and mathematical physicists. And we don't want to waste our time with it too much. But then I encountered the rotating wave approximation in my research. And the truth is that the rotating wave approximation is really everywhere in quantum mechanics. And as David mentioned, also more so in quantum technology nowadays. And so if you go on Google Scholar and you check how many papers use the rotating wave approximation, you put RWA in Google Scholar. Well, actually, if you put RWA, it turns out that the acronym also has a completely different meaning, right-wing authoritarianism. Um, and I'm not claiming to be able to tame that, unfortunately. But if you put rotating wave approximation, you find about a million results. So really, it is very common. And the reason that it is so common is because it simplifies so much. It gives an analytical intuition to what's going on in the dynamics of a system. And I would say from a fundamental perspective, it defines the very idea of resonance in quantum physics. And I'll come back to that later. And so because it is so important, um, it's important to understand it well. And as David mentioned, you know, quantum technology is important these days and it's moving from a, uh, actually the quantitative and qualitative are the wrong way around here. It's moving from a qualitative age to a quantitative age because nowadays it's no longer enough to just see some mere hints of coherence or entanglement and so on, but you really need to say how good you are. And, um, you know, you need really high uh, fidelities. An example of this, and that was one of the motivations of our research, is quantum error correction, where you need error rates of, well, it depends on which error code we're looking at, maybe 10 to the minus 3, maybe 10 to the minus 6. And if your error rate is, is bigger than that, then your experiment is somehow useless as a quantum computer. It is not scalable. So these are very stringent demands. And I would like to argue that, of course, external errors, decoherence, dissipation, so it's important. But besides these, modeling errors will eventually become the bottleneck of this. So we need to, in, in every step of the calculations and the predictions, we need to, to, to have under control which error we make. And so that's why I think it's important to look at the rotating wave approximation in more detail. So what is the rotating wave approximation? The mantra goes that highly oscillatory terms in a differential equation can be detected. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there are at least three completely different manifestations of this in quantum physics. The first one, which I call here nuclear magnetic resonance, but you could also say that's a semi-classical light matter interaction, is where you have linear polarized light driving a system and you replace that with circular polarized light. But here the light is described in a classical manner. The second one comes from quantum optics or light matter interactions with where the light is indeed treated as a quantum object itself. So you have the quantum Rabi model describing that to a certain approximation itself. And you replace that with the James Cummings interaction. The third one is in open quantum systems. So this is often used where you do some approximations first, like the bone markov approximation. You end up with what is called the Redfield equation. And then under the rotating wave approximation, it becomes the GKLS equation, the Lindblad equation. So here in this talk, I will look only at the first two cases. And I would argue that the highlight of my talk is a rigorous justification of the second rotating wave approximation. So as David pointed out, this is a rather old physics. The James Cummings paper, the seminal paper is more than 60 years old now. And so it's interesting for me. So let's start with the semi-classical case. 
this is the historically the very first rotating wave approximation, and it's also conceptually the easiest one to explain. So it's a good starting point. Now, as you all know, it is incredibly rare to find analytical solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. There's only a handful of them, even for a single qubit, a two-level system. And so one of them was found by Rabi in 37, is a, a qubit or two-level system described with Pauli Z here, the energy levels, uh, driven by rotating light, circularly polarized light, with some frequency omega that doesn't need to be the same as the frequency of your qubit, and some drive strength g. And what Rabi realized is that this time-dependent Schrodinger equation can be solved analytically. Nowadays, we of course know that you just go into a rotating frame and you remove the time dependence of the field. So it's very straightforward, but it was a big achievement at the time, I suppose. And <clears throat> Rabi studied two level systems driven by circularized, circularly polarized light and realized that you can see resonance. And so this is the origin of nuclear magnetic resonance. But he also realized that experimentally, it is much easier to create linear polarized light. And in this case, you have this differential equation here. This is the um, classical Rabi model. And, and this is much harder to solve. And so in the original paper by Rabi from 1938, where he introduced the rotating wave approximation, he wrote that this is experimentally more convenient to use an oscillating field and that the observables are approximately the same when the fields are weak and near resonance. Now, Rabi, of course, reported on this experimentally, so there was no need for justifying this. But uh, these studies led ultimately to the Nobel Prize he got for nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, Rabi did not coin this, the rotating wave approximation. He just made the approximation. But I think from the history, I think a, a good name at this point would have been to call it the rotating field approximation because you're replacing a linear field by a rotating field. I'll come back to that on the next slide. Shortly after Rabi, Bloch and Siegert gave a complete analysis of the scenario, and they gave a perturbative de derivation of the rotating wave approximation, and uh, also the corrections to the rotating wave approximation where you obtain, for example, the Bloch-Siegert shift. It's interesting historically, that a few months later, Stevenson came up with the same solution in an arguably much more elegant paper. Um, and he managed to publish it, but, but he, he says himself that he got scooped by Bloch and Siegert. And nowadays, we probably mostly remember Bloch and Siegert for this work. OK, I'm skipping some points in the history now. There's a paper in 1954, which is often quoted in the context of rotating wave approximation. Although it's really not about rotating wave approximation, but it's about the rotating frame. So by that time, people understood the use of rotating frames in quantum mechanics. And um, anyway, not the rotating wave approximation. The person who I believe coined the term rotating wave approximation was Lamb in 57, who wrote in a particular context that the rotating wave approximation works well. So you see, I think the, the, the name rotating wave approximation is an unfortunate name because it mixes the rotating field approximation, which Rabi discovered, essentially with the rotating wave function that you have when you have a rotating frame. And I would like to argue in this talk that this is an unfortunate name because the rotating wave approximation is independent of the rotating frame. You can do it in any frame you like. Now, jumping a bit further in history, another seminal paper by Shirley in 64 showed another way of obtaining the rotating wave approximation by using a Floquet approach. And there's also in the nuclear magnetic resonance community, there was a paper in 68 where the Magnus expansion was used to find the rotating wave approximation. So these are probably the main techniques used nowadays. Just a side remark here, which David already touched on, um, there's much more recent work in the beginning of 2000 um, where people realized that even the linearly driven Rabi model can be solved analytically by confluent Hoyne functions. And the solutions are rather complex and unwieldy, but, but it was amazing to see that 
that you can still make such a, a significant theoretical progress on such an old model. So let me start revising the undergraduate version of this, the way I came across this at my undergraduate. So this slide is very elementary and you should be able to follow the calculations step by step if you know the product rule. So we have the linearly driven Rabi model, which I described by H1 of T. And we want to solve the Schrodinger equation. Of course, I said H bar equal to one here. And we want to go into a rotating frame. This is what is usually done in the undergraduate. So you look at the, the free evolution of um, the qubit, but not with the, with the original frequency, but with the driving frequency. And you look at the product of this uh, unitary with the unitary that you want to solve for. And you ask yourself, can I write down a Schrodinger equation for it? And of course you can, that's the rotating frame. So the first thing is that you observe the boundary condition is trivially the identity. And then you want to take a derivative and then you use the product rule to get one term from the right. So that's the derivative of U, which gives you the H1 and a derivative from the left, which gives you this. And um, I think, um, yeah, so this is then usually called the detuning. I might have made a sign mistake here. I have to check that later. This is called the detuning. Um, so this simplifies a little bit like this. And um, then what you want to do in order to get a close differential equation in R is you want to move this guy here to the right side. But of course it doesn't commute with sigma x. So the way you solve this is by introducing an identity here and keeping it on the left. And then on the right side, you got the evolution R of T for which you want to find the differential equation. And here, well, you can calculate that, right? This would have been an undergraduate exercise, how a sigma X evolves under sigma Z. Well, that's some oscillation. And then you multiply out, use the double angular formula and you get this differential equation here which I'm sure you're mostly familiar with. So this is not an approximation. This is just the rotating frame. So solving this differential equation is equally hard to solving it in the original picture. And this is the point where your teacher would have said, well, we're now invoking this mantra of highly oscillatory terms, which can be neglected. So the teacher would usually just cross out those terms and I'm sure we've all seen this so many times that maybe we don't question this anymore, but I'd like to question it a little bit. So the first question is, why can we do this? What justifies doing this when these terms are not small? I mean, the, the norm of these terms is not small, not even the average norm of this. And why did we have to go into a rotating frame in the first place? You might have wondered that in your undergraduate. Could we not also do it in the rotating frame? Because if if this guy oscillates quickly, well, then this guy oscillates quickly as well, doesn't it? So can't we just cross it out here? <clears throat> and of course that gives a completely different solution. So it's, it's apparent that this is not the same. So maybe some of us even wondered whether the factor two here is the important thing compared to these oscillations. Of course it's not, but maybe the thought comes up. And if we do need to go into a rotating frame, why is it this one? There are so many different rotating frame. What makes this one correct? And if there is a correct frame, how do we find the correct one? And I would say that no matter which way you think about the rotating wave approximation, the main question you should ask yourself, is it a qualitative argument or can you turn it into a quantitative one? So can you answer the question, how big the error is that you make when you do this approximation? For example, how small should G over omega, the ratio between the coupling and the drive frequency be so that the error is less than say 1% in some measure? Another question that we were interested in is how does the error change with evolution time? So when you're unsatisfied with the undergraduate education, you might start looking in the literature, which is also what I did. And I checked about 75 quantum mechanics and quantum optics textbook. And many of them justify the rotating wave approximation by the concept of resonance. 
I, I, I would argue that, that this is a bit circular because I would argue that the rotating approx wave approximation actually defines the idea of resonance. There are some uh, geometric ways to go into several rotating counter rotating frames, but they are also somewhat hand waving because they rely on eventually saying that terms are neglected due to being of resonance. If you are in nuclear magnetic resonance, you might defer the readers to quantum optics literature. This is what often happens. If you are in quantum optics, you might defer the audience to nuclear magnetic resonance. Or if you're a German, you might give it as a homework to your students. You might also just simply state that this is a fairly good or a usual thing to do. Um, <clears throat> and when you look in the literature, you find some, some other approaches. One of them I, I want to highlight here that is interesting, where James and Jerk um, show that, that you can derive the rotating effect approximation if you assume that all measurements in quantum mechanics are somewhat slow, that, that highly oscillatory terms are simply not observable. And I think this is an interesting approach, but it's not the reason why the rotating wave approximation is correct. You can give perturbative arguments like we see in the paper by Bloch and Siegert. You can use a theory, um, Krylov, Bogolyubov, Mitropolsky, which is um, originally for nonlinear differential equations. It's a theory of averaging them. Uh, it's a very powerful theory, and you can, you can show that at least in the limit, the rotating wave approximation becomes exact. And uh, another book that I want to recommend is Domenico D'Alessandro's book on uh, quantum control, where he uses the gronwald bellman lemma to um, obtain a version of the rotating wave approximation. So now it's time to start talking about our results in this area. And our result is mainly a simple bound for it. So what I would like to do on the next slide is to go with you through this bound and, and how we derive it in a very simple lemma, which we call the integration by part lemma, um, which I want to explain to you step by step really. So I think you can also follow the details of this calculation here if you know the product rule. Um, and, and in order to frame this, I'm gonna consider two arbitrary time dependent Hamiltonians. So this need not be the rotating wave approximation. It's much more general than that. So we consider those arbitrary time dependent Hamiltonians, let's focus on the finite dimensional case here. Look at their Schrodinger equations with uh, boundary conditions. You also can Hermitian conjugate them. I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need this version as well. And what you want to do is you want to express the, the difference of the two evolutions. You want to estimate that. So one trivial identity is this one here because U1, U1 dagger just disappears. And this is just the identity. So this is the same as this. And when you write it like this, it looks like boundary terms coming from an integration. So you can write it as a boundary term. And then you can invoke Papa Riemann to write it as the integral over the derivative. Now, when you take this derivative here, you have to know the product rule. So you get something coming from the right and something from the left. From the right, you get H2, from the left, you get H1. And so at this point, what we define is the integral over the difference of two Hamiltonians. So this has the unit of an action, so we call it the integral action. And when you look at the left-hand side here, this is the derivative of this newly defined integral action. And we now have an integral which contains a derivative and so what we want is to get rid of this derivative. And the way you do this is by integration by parts. So you move the derivative to the left and to the right. What you get is a boundary term without any derivatives. And you get a term where you have moved the derivative from the middle to the left and where you have moved the derivative from the middle to the right. The boundary term here simplifies a little bit because this is just the identity. And when we take those derivatives, we get, get terms from the left and from the right. So from the right, we get H2, but of course in the middle, we already have this integral action. And from the left, we get H1. And in the middle, we have the integral action. There's a very simple calculation, but this is already the key formula for my talk. 
because what it achieves is that it expresses the difference in two evolutions in terms of this newly defined integral action. And the interesting thing is that even when two Hamiltonians are not close, the integral action can be small. And this is exactly what happens in the rotating wave approximation because terms average away. So the origin of the average is not really that measurement is slow, but the origin of the average is simply explained by this integration by part. So let's apply this to the semi-classical rotating wave approximation. So here's again the formula that we have just derived on the last slide. What we can do is we can take norms on both sides. And so, you know, the norm of a unitary is just one. So we get just S of T here. This goes away. We can bring the norm in the integral. These unitaries go away. We get a lot of simplification, especially if we bound S of T by its supremum. Then we can take this out of the integral and we're left with this simple formula here. Now we can start plugging in our Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian of the um, <clears throat> linearly driven system in the rotating frame. This is the Hamiltonian of the, uh, of the, sorry, this is the, um, sorry, my mind is freezing. Um, this is the, the rotating oscillation in the rotating frame. This is the linear one in the rotating frame. And so for these Hamiltonians, it's very easy to compute their norms, which we need for this formula here. And we can compute the action, which is the integral of the difference. And so we have to integrate sine functions. We get a one over omega here. And we can estimate the norm of that term as well. And we get a very simple bound that tells us that the, the, the difference of these two terms can be bounded by something that has a g over omega in front. So let me make a few remarks on this bound. So first of all, this bound is an operator norm. So you know when you look at rotating wave approximation, many people look at states or they look at the spectrum. But I think it's in quantum information, you really want to look at the norm difference because that tells you what is the gate error when you use these as gates. The second question is, what is the unit of this? I mean, what, is it, what does it mean for this error to be big and what does it mean for this error to be small? Now, you know, the norm difference between two unitaries is always between zero and two. And it, it, it is a, a way of measuring the gate error. And as I mentioned before, for quantum information, maybe you need to be in the order of 10 to the minus three or much lower for quantum error correcting codes. So if, if this is a percentage, if this is 0 0.01, it's already too big. Now, as you can see here, for any fixed evolution time t, as you make this ratio g over omega going to zero, you indeed get the rotating wave approximation becomes more and more accurate. So the rotating wave approximation can be justified this way. But you might wonder, you know, this, this bound here grows in time. What about the error of the evolutions? Is it true that I can really just substitute my original Hamiltonian with the rotating wave one, and then I just have that one forever and ever? Or does the error accumulate as the bound would seem to indicate? And indeed, the error grows in time. What you can prove and what we proved in the paper, the first one I mentioned, is that if you take the supremum of an error of time over all times, you get a really big error. And this can be understood in terms of an accumulation of a bloch siegert shift and higher orders of that. Of course, another remark is that this bound becomes loose very quickly. So you could try to get a more accurate version of this bound. Now, let me make some comments also on the concept of rotating frames. So this is the formula that we use to justify the rotating wave approximation. And the point is that you can make the rotating wave approximation in any frame. For example, in the lab frame, you can just say, well, this is my original Hamiltonian and this is my rotating wave approximation. There's nothing wrong with that because the error in, is, is equally big in any frame because they're unitarily related. 
However, if you want to use our method to prove the rotating wave approximation, it will only work in certain frames because you can see here that yes, the action needs to be small, but also you need this term to remain small when the parameter, in our case, g over omega becomes small. So what could happen and what indeed happens here in the lab frame is when you're on resonance or near resonance, this term actually grows with omega. And so this explodes. So it doesn't help you that the action becomes small. What you need is really the action to be small and the Hamiltonian part to be under control. And this explains why naively taking this mantra and, and removing oscillating terms from a differential equation can also be wrong. And this explains why you can't just, for example, cross out this term here when you're near resonance. What we also discovered in the paper is that there is, in some sense, a canonical frame. And that is given by either of the two evolutions. Because what you can show, roughly speaking, is that then the action is small in this frame if and only if the two evolutions are close. However, this is usually impractical because usually you can't integrate either of the two Hamiltonians of interest here. Um, or the, the integrals might look might be quite complicated. Now, a final point I want to make about the semi-classical case is um, about the interplay between the rotating wave approximation and control, because my background is quantum control. And what I find quite interesting is, 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 is what happens to an approximation when you start controlling it. I mean, not the approximation, but when you control the system. And in quantum technology, we often have that case because we not only apply the rotating wave approximation, but we also put an envelope function g of t to our system where we say, now we switch on the driving and now we switch it off. And so what you might ask yourself is, can I simply apply the rotating wave approximation to such a driven system as I did in the previous case and just replace that cosine sigma x term here with the corresponding rotating field. Now, the answer to this is complicated. It is somewhat yes, but as you would imagine, it doesn't only depend on omega and g, which were the, the two parameters in the previous derivation, but it also depends on how fast is g of t. So in the paper, we have developed bounds for how fast you're switching on and off your, your, your drive. And so the interplay between approximations and driving is often a subtle story because the approximations that might be perfectly valid in the absence of driving might be invalidated by the driving. And that is something I find quite interesting. Okay, so the final part of my talk, I want to come to the full quantum light matter interaction. And this is really where the, the untamed rotating wave approximation is no longer a lion, but really a dragon. Because what we have to talk about when we talk about field operators is unbounded operators. And these are much more hard to treat. Um, and so, so this is a, a, a typical picture of, of, of an atom interacting with a light field. And um, very, very naively here, these golden balls are supposed to look like, I mean, are supposed to be photons. This is of course a completely wrong picture of what photons really are. But um, the, the takeaway message from this slide is going to be that the photon number actually matters quite a lot to the rotating wave approximation. Now, often nowadays, we, we put this in cavities to amplify the coupling strength between light and matter. And we can do that either in optical setup or we can do it in quantum electrodynamics. So what is the rotating wave approximation in this case? So we have a two-level atom interacting with a quantum field. Um, so, so a similar model to what we had before, but instead of um, coupling here with a cosine x, we couple with actually the, the, um, the field here. And we have, of course, the, the evolution of the field. And this is an incredibly, as David mentioned in his introduction, it's an incredibly rich model, incredibly complex model. And there's been a lot of progress over the last 20 years, which is summarized in this very nice review paper here about analytical solutions also for the quantum case, integrability, confluent Hoyne functions, and all sorts of stuff. None of which is really relevant for my talk because I'm gonna talk about 
the approximation into the Jane's Cummings model, which is a lot simpler. So what Jane's Cummings did is they approximated this Hamiltonian with this Hamiltonian here. And so if you see this the first time, you might ask, how is this a rotating wave approximation? I mean, there aren't any driven, then there isn't any driving. So how is it that there is anything oscillating quickly? But of course, you know the answer. You go into the rotating frame with respect to the local terms. And then the quantum Rabi model up here becomes time dependent. <clears throat> and you get these oscillations here. And then you can apply the mantra and you can say these are highly oscillatory and you can cross them out. Actually, it's interesting in the literature, often also people in this context argue that these terms are not energy conserving. I want to comment this. That's a little bit puzzling because, I mean, this is a time independent Hamiltonian and it, it trivially conserves its own energy. It defines the very concept of energy. Uh, so when you say here, that these are not energy conserving, um, we have to think a little bit of what, which energy are we actually talking about? And of course, what we mean is that we mean the approximate energy of the local part of the Hamiltonian and we think perturbatively. Anyway, <clears throat> this is then the rotating wave approximation. And when Jaynes and Cummings came, came across this or introduced it, the approximation was just unquestionable. In some sense, there was no need to justify it even because the coupling between light and matter is so weak, the natural coupling, that even when you have high photon numbers, which they had, um, you could neglect it. You could neglect the counter-rotating terms. Nowadays, of course, as many of you will know, in quantum electrodynamics and in um, quantum circuit uh, dynamics, uh, we, can, we can or we need to amplify this coupling to get um, strong or ultra co strong coupling regimes. In fact, if you look at the literature, there's a bit like when you look at the menu at Starbucks, there's all sorts of regimes. There's the weak coupling, the strong coupling. It's like the coffee sizes at Starbucks. There's the deep strong coupling regime, the extreme co strong coupling regime. This is taken from a, a, a very extensive book on the, on the Rabi model, on the James Cummings model and its derivatives. And so the, the common law goes that you should look at G over omega. And if G over omega is small enough, then the rotating wave approximation is valid. So in my talk, I want to question this a little bit. And of course, I, I don't have time to derive the results as explicitly as I could uh, for the finite dimensional case. So I first want to summarize only the results. So the first result is that for any non-zero choice of G of omega, the rotating wave approximation is terribly bad in the sense that the evolution of, of the Rabi model compared with the evolution of the, of the James Cummings model will always be far away from each other because one over six is big in this context. So this may be a little bit puzzling if you first come across it, but the rotating wave approximation is nonetheless correct in the sense that if you fix a state in Hilbert space, and this can be any, any state in Hilbert space, and you look at the difference of the evolutions applied to that state, then that will go to zero. This should be G of omega, not G. So, <clears throat> so the rotating wave approximation is valid and, and we justify it in this exact sense as a limit. And of course, if you know a little bit more about unbounded operators, this is not surprising because we often only get state dependence convergence as, as here and not norm convergence as there. Now, you want to know also how good is the approximation wave, uh, the rotating wave approximation. You, you don't just want to know that in the limit it works. So in this case, what we found is if we have states, roughly speaking with finite first and second moment of the number operator, then we can estimate the convergence speed as well. And what we find is that the convergence speed, roughly speaking, goes like, like this, where we have um, an expected, uh, the expectation of the number operator here roughly, and this is expectation of the number operator squared. So we also checked how good these bounds are when we compare numerically um, 
what is the error for particular states? And in this case, we looked at Fox states. So we looked at the exact numerics and we looked at uh, the, uh, an, the upper bound that I presented on the previous slide here. And also we found a lower bound for the error. And what you should take away from this bound here is that we have the actual dynamics under pretty much good control. And a, a simplified uh, version of this result is when you look at the error on a Fox state and you look at this error over some relatively short time interval up to pi over omega, um, then the error can be upper bounded by the number of photons and it can be lower bounded by something that as the number of photons go to infinity goes to one over six. So no matter how small your G is, you will always find a bad approximation in the rotating wave approximation when you have a high number of photons. And this is really the takeaway message of this part of the talk that the photon number matters even for short times. On the other hand, if the photon number is fixed and G goes to zero, then the rotating wave approximation works. And so roughly speaking, this is the relevant parameter for the rotating wave approximation. It's not just G over omega, but it comes with the photon number dressed. And this again is important in, in quantum technology as we have now experiments where we can have hundreds of photons in the cavity in controlled ways. And um, also in quantum error correcting codes, you need a relatively high photon number for um, you know, promising types of uh, codes which use the, uh, the light field. So these are called GKP or CAT codes. Um, so maybe not quite 100, but maybe 10 or 20 photons are needed in this case because you need squeezing, roughly speaking. And uh, so it's important when you want to evaluate the rotating wave approximation to take this into account. So my final technical slide then is just to give you a brief, brief proof idea. So, so how did we do this? And essentially we used the same formula that we derived in the finite dimensional case. And we mimicked it by applying this formula to states and look at only what happens on states. And, and which states did we use? So we used a dense set of states, which are the essentially the Schwartz functions. So these are the functions that decay fast enough in both position and momentum space. What we had to show is that all operators involved are essentially self-adjoint, so valid Hamiltonians on this dense domain and that they leave it invariant. And this is not so difficult to show because these are, you know, they, they only have a, a something like A dagger, A dagger or A dagger A. So when you act on Schwartz functions, you, you stay in Schwartz space. Um, the main trick, however, was to, you know, this, this formula has a symmetry with respect to U1 and U2. You can, you can choose which one you call U1 and which one you call U2. But the real important part is to use H2 as the James Cummings Hamiltonian, because the James Cummings Hamiltonian is really the one that we can solve analytically easily. So if this is the first thing that acts on a state, then um, we can we can control what happens to that state under this evolution. And when we act with these operators on the state, they are still well-defined and finite for the correct choice of states. We also have to show for this that this uh, dense domain is actually left invariant by U2, but that is not so difficult either because U2 can be solved uh, analytically. Okay, so the final part for the bound in this then that all the operators involved um, cannot change the photon numbers much. And so this allows us to derive the bound. So finally, let me just reiterate uh, the collaborators and the, the publication related to this work. As I said, the second one is, is currently just in submission. Uh, there's a couple of questions in my talk, which I'll answer in a second, but I just wanna give you the conclusions first. They're very brief. So the first conclusion is that both rotating wave approximation number one, the classical Rabi model, and number two can be tamed by integration by parts. And with this, you get quantitative bounds for a very old problem. And in the quantum case, the photon number is, is important to determine the quality. 
Now, what I didn't talk about, what I think, however, is also interesting is that the same methods can be applied to many other limits. So in, in the first paper that I quoted, we uh, proved, for example, the Trotter theorem, adiabatic theorem, quantum xenodynamics, dynamical decoupling uh, using this. And also the, the methods for the quantum Rabi model can also be used to treat derivatives of the James Cummings model and prove the rotating wave approximation, bound the rotating wave approximation for those models. And uh, rotating wave approximation number three is a uh, work in progress. So with this, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for turning up here and, and uh, for your attention. And I leave it to, to David to, um, David to, to uh, organize the questions. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was a really interesting talk, actually. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A panel. Oh, uh, Howard Weisman makes the comment. I thought you were a mathematical physicist. That's, <laughs> that's the old adage, right? Are you a mathematical physicist or a theoretical physicist? That depends for the mathematics department on whether you're bringing in money or you represent an expense and vice versa, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but there's a question here from Zimmerman Lee. Uh, you mentioned two kinds of errors concerning the rotating wave approximation applied to the quantum Rabi model. In real quantum technology, which one of them matters? I, I suppose you're referring to, um, if I understand your question correctly, the two types of error being one being the um, the um, the integral action being small and the other one being the Hamiltonians being under control. Yeah, I believe so. Um, for the quantum Rabi model, it's, it's, it's a harder question because the norm of the Hamiltonians is actually infinite. So they are unbounded operators. They are not under control. So you have to apply them to states. Um, and so then I would say that to answer your question, it's, it's, it depends on what state you're acting on. If you're acting on uh, a state with very few photons, I would argue that the dominant error comes from G over omega not being small enough. And if there are many photons, you can have the case that G over omega might be small, but the error is big because of the state being big. Right. Um, then David Ferry had a question. Your upper bound, your upper error bound with the one over, or was it? I think you might have typed the question wrong. Is it one over 216? g squared times n. I don't think that was the exact term. But anyway, it seems to blow up for quite a large error when g is relatively small. Is there a value for g um, uh, such that the upper bound uh, remains valid? Yeah. Um, so um, is it? So it is the lower bound that contains a, a term that is g squared over n. Yeah. And so, of course, if if um, yeah, that's right. This lower bound can trivialize quite easily. Hmm. For example, if G is really small, um, then this this is this just says that this is bigger than zero. So it doesn't say, say anything. This bound becomes interesting when N becomes large. So the point is that no matter which value of G, or this should probably be G over omega, I apologize. I changed notation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if if no matter how, how small G over omega is, you can always make this error become big, you can you can get one over six here um, by uh, tuning up the number of photons. And this was um, this was this result here. So if you look at a state in, if you're trying to make sense of this in a state independent way, you cannot. So there's no critical value of G after which magically the rotating value wave approximation suddenly works. Right. I mean, in your one of the things that I was worrying about was in your definition of the norm uh, so that you can define the, the, the difference between the two unitaries, um, what, what, what impact, for example, do different choices of global phase have on that norm? I mean, are you going to get, can you get arbitrarily, you can get states that are arbitrarily different, but only different with respect to um, um, arbitrary choice of phases? Yeah, this is a, an interesting question. Actually, of course, you can argue that the you should only look at adjoint dynamics and, and you should mm. only look at um, things which don't have global phases, mm. um, uh, which, which, which don't take into account global phases. So this choice of norm here 
cares about global faces, which is somewhat artificial. Mm. Um, I guess one reason why we did it this way is was because it was easier. Uh, the second reason we did it this way is because the rotating wave approximation even works on this level. So also the phases will tune up eventually right. um, on a particular state. And the other reason is that you might have some complicated interference experiments where you perform the rotating wave approximation only on one leg. And then of yeah. course those global phases become uh, those, those global phases become local and observable. Absolutely, yeah. However, what I can say to answer your question a little bit is I did some numerics where I looked at um, the semi-classical model and I looked at the validity of the rotating wave approximation over time, first of all, on the level of unitaries and then on the level of channels or on the level of a joint action. And the joint action unitary also becomes arbitrarily bad after time. So it's not just a phase that messes things up, but the time at which this happens is much, much later. So indeed at the beginning, you just have a phase difference. And I think that's related to the bloch Ziegert shift, but over a long time, it's not just a phase difference that matters. Okay. Um, and the other question, the other, I was wondering if you had a hidden assumption related to the, um, value of the detuning in this in your uh, calculations i mean what what happens for example in the limit of large detuning is it is everything still working no so yeah good point um so indeed um what i assume i mean after i introduced this value d delta for the detuning i assume that delta is fixed and doesn't scale with omega yeah yeah so it's a good point so if of course if delta scales with omega then the rotating wave approximation is also not good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, you, just before I get to Peter Drummond's question, which is waiting there, oh, there's several questions, good. Um, you mentioned that it works uh, for certain choices of frames. And in particular, you mentioned, um, I think you refer to them as canonical frames. Can you give, I, I got the impression that was a bit circular. Um, your canonical frame was one that worked and it, works if it's, a, if it's a canonical frame. And maybe that's an incorrect, um, uh, maybe that's a misunderstanding that I, that I got from your talk. Is there, a, is there a way of defining what would represent a canonical frame in the, in the context that you're using here? I wouldn't say it's circular. So what you have to do is you have to solve one of the two dynamics, no matter whether the first one or the second one, and, and bring the other Hamiltonian in that frame. Oh, okay. I see. So right. for the rotating wave approximation, it wouldn't be quite the same that we usually do. Yeah. But we would solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a circular repolarized light, and we would go into that frame. And, and the nice thing about this canonical frame is that then, um, under some assumptions, which, which we explain in the paper in detail, but then it becomes an if and only if relationship between the smallness of the action and the and the um, validity of the approximation, roughly speaking. So what you, what, what you have, if you go into this canonical frame, you don't have to search for a frame anymore. You just have to check the action. Whereas if you don't do that, for any frame that you're trying, you still have to check not only is the action small, but you also have to check is the Hamiltonian small. Oh, I see. However, hmm. in most applications, this is a hopeless approach because you cannot solve either, either of the two dynamics. Yeah, and and so I agree with you that in that respect it has a circular, a little bit of a useless flavor. But it was maybe just satisfying from a. In fact, this was a suggestion by a referee to look at this. It was satisfying as an abstract problem to to think of what is the the best possible frame and when and what when one can look at this. Oh, that, yeah, it's really really interesting. There's a few more questions in um, Peter Drummond. Since two level atoms don't exist, there are an infinite number of non-resonant terms in most experiments depending on the gauge choice, have you thought about uh, the effects of this? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of um, people, I mean, usually when the rotating wave approximation breaks down, also the two level approximation breaks down. Um, and I'm aware of, of, of the literature discussing uh, validity of certain gauges in, in that case, um, but we haven't looked at it. I think, I think it's, it's reasonable to start looking at that as well. And with the techniques we have developed, it should be possible to derive bounds in this case as well. But we wanted to start with something relatively simple 
Right. Well, that makes sense. Uh, Zimmerman had a follow-up question to his earlier one. You mentioned the quantity uh, g root n over omega as the key element in the in the quantum case. Uh, this conclusion seems apparent when you observe the valid regime of the chance coming model spectrum compared to the quantum Rabi model spectrum. In this sense, can we safely justify an approximation by the valid regime of its predicted spectrum? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I know that there are lots of works uh, comparing the two spectra. Um, on an abstract level, of course, if you have matching spectra, that doesn't mean that you have matching evolutions because mm. you can have very different eigenstates. Um, one would not usually expect this, and I don't think it's the case. So it might be that for the quantum Rabi model, spectral information is quite a good measure of validity of the rotating wave approximation. But we, we wanted to avoid even having to look at this uh, with limited information, so to say, the, the spectral information. So that's why we looked at the at the at the regime of uh, unitaries. Of course, also, I mean, what goes into this picture of the square root of n is that that you are actually looking at Fox states or that you're looking at states that have a well-defined uh, photon number or at least a well-defined expectation number of photons. So what you'll find actually is that the, the speed at which state converge to the rotating wave approximation is strongly state dependent. And they are basically states that are arbitrarily slow. Um, <clears throat> once you go out of this picture where, where square root of N is, is well-defined. So, but I, I would say, I mean, I, I agree with you, uh, Simin. So, so it is a good, um, it is probably a good indicator, but it's just not, it doesn't really give you a full control or, or a bound. It doesn't give you a number of, you know, is it 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus five that you actually get in the validity. So that's why we wanted to derive a bound. And David Ferry finally would like, he just wants to understand a bit better about the, um, the bound um, vanishing or uh, for small g. And could you pop those, maybe pop those error bound formulas up again from your slides? That might make it easier. I think this one here, no? So, um, yeah, so for small g, the upper bound goes to zero. So that means the approximation gets better and better. We're not seeing your, we're not seeing the slide. Oh, am um, I not sharing the slide? Sorry. Yeah, um, not, not, not at the moment, Daniel. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah we're, yeah, we're not seeing your slide at the, at the moment. Ah, I'm, I'm not sharing my screen. I'm so no, sorry. No, no, that's okay. How did I Here start? we go. Okay. Yeah, so, that's it. Okay, so um, right. So if G goes, I sorry, and that's that's the confusion earlier because I was pointing to some parts on my slide, and and I thought oh, no, that's okay. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so if G is small, then the error is small because it's the error is upper bounded by something that is proportional to G. The lower bound, if G is small, goes to minus infinity. The lower bound is just trivial. You don't get any information for it. I think, I think that that was already your question, uh, David. But um, just to iterate what I said earlier, if you fix G and you let N go to infinity, then the lower bound actually kicks in and you get a bad error. You get one over six. Right, okay. Um, another question from B. Dalton. Um, can the breakdown of the rotating wave association, uh, rotating wave approximation, be usefully discussed in terms of the effect of counter-rotating terms on the eigenstate of the dressed atom? Is his question. I don't know. I uh, I, I always get confused when I see see dressed uh, pictures and um, yeah yeah. I, I don't know what the what what these eigenstates are and whether one can compute them. So I I, I know it's a lame answer, but I, I I wouldn't be able to comment. Oh no, that's a good answer. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. We've got someone here recognizes your hard work. Um, and I think we oh no, David's got a follow-up. We originally saw the term as positive, not negative, hence his confusion. So thank you. You have answered David's question. So thanks very much, Daniel, for a really, really good talk. Um, as you saw by all, the, all of their questions, it certainly um, uh, was a, a subject of a, a great deal of interest. Um, and I would remind everybody that uh, this is the last talk for this calendar year, but we'll be having another series next year.
Uh, thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the work. It's an enormous amount of work to prepare one of these presentations, and we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. All right. All the best, everyone, and we'll see you again next year. Cheers.